Hello there, everyone. Uh, this is our next lecture uh, on the Reformation. So this, uh, this lecture we're going to talk about women in the age of Reformations, give you the overview of the progress of the Reformation up to the 1560s or so, and then talk about that, how this impacted women, and partly to give you an idea just how far reaching the Reformation was and what things it did, what it, did, what it didn't do, because you're going to be doing a paper in a couple of weeks. You know, it focuses on the wars of religion and, okay, how much are they about religion? As you're going to see, not every change that comes out of the Reformation really has its unique cause in the Reformation anyway. Uh, but it's also a good way because women, of course, in this period are and seem to be inferior and um, they're treated in second-class status and so on and so forth. And yet even they are caught up in all this. So you see how far-reaching the effects of this uh, momentous change were. So let's, uh, let's get started in this. Oh, by the way, if you watched the last video, uh, I do have a dog, so if you bark, I apologize. There are also workers working next door to me in my apartment complex. So if you hear any noises, I apologize for that before we start. <clears throat> and so just an overview, uh, Christendom divided uh, about what happens following 1521 when Martin Luther, we talked about him last time, talking about reform and where it came from. And, uh, as soon as um, you know Luther's uh, Reformation gets uh, gets underway, um, there are there's a lot of uh, you know things going on all of a sudden, and people will take up his ideas in ways he did not he did not really anticipate or want. He was not a social reformer, uh, and so uh, he thought of himself as being a purely a religious thinker. However. <laughs> People, and I'll mention the Peasants' War a lot next time, the lecture on the wars of religion, but the Peasants' War, uh, it's something that breaks out, I mentioned this last time, a few years after um, the Diet of Worms in 1524, which was essentially a, a peasant revolt in the Middle Ages. You're always having revolts in the latter, latter part of the Middle Ages of peasants against their lords, complaining about taxes, church taxes, tithing, stuff like that. What makes this one different <clears throat> is that these um, peasants who, by the way, organize their own armies and they organize, they write a pamphlet called the 12 Articles listing their grievances against their feudal lords. They explicitly appeal to, uh, appeal to Luther's ideas uh, about the freedom of a Christian and stuff like that. That they, you know, God didn't ordain all these laws and therefore we should be free from them, which he explicitly condemns. He absolutely condemns in no certain terms as they should be wiped out. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. <clears throat> he has no truck with this at all. And when uh, Imperial troops do eventually come back from Italy, they do slaughter them uh, en masse in pretty brutal, brutal ways. Uh, and this is part and parcel of, of Luther's attitude toward other reformers. He doesn't like them very much. <laughs> he thinks he's got everything right. And um, in fact, Ian calls them at one point the false brethren when they don't agree with him. It's a, it's a reference to the Bible and to the letters of Paul. <clears throat> And um, this comes out pretty quickly within the first few years. At the same time, in early 1520s, as, as he's going through what he's doing in Germany, you have a Reformation coming elsewhere spontaneously. Ulrich Zwingli uh, is uh, the leader of the Reformation in the cities of, uh, of Switzerland, uh, in Zurich. And he is a former priest who you know, leaves the priesthood. And with the help of the city council, initiates the Reformation there. They start taking over churches and reorganizing along reformed lines. Zwingli shared a lot of Luther's critique of the church, but he went even farther. Uh, he basically, as you'll see, he denies, this is one of the things that the reformers fall out on, is the nature of the Eucharist. Remember that that old, the Catholic view is that the the uh, the um, bread and wine during the uh, during the uh, uh, liturgy become the body and blood of Christ. Um, this is transubstantiation. This is the doctrine they have. Um, Luther rejects this, but he still retains a kind of idea that Christ is somehow present in the Eucharist somehow. But Zwingli and virtually the rest of the reformers are going to take a very different line on this. That's going to be a division very quickly. And um, you're going to have them fall out over this. And in fact, uh, in the next few years, you're going to have them fall out with a lot of them, even though they all look to Luther as their guide, because he's the one who sort of broke the spell of the medieval church. And in fact, uh, with other people, like Andreas Kallus Tarlstadt was a professor of Wittenberg. He becomes fairly radicalized by what Luther does. Uh, Luther spends a couple of years away from Wittenberg. When he goes back, he finds things have changed. Uh, he'll become more conservative in his, his beliefs over time because of this. 
But they attempt <clears throat> do um, the reformers in the late 1520s to try to work all this stuff out. Um, they actually have a meeting in 1529 at uh, Marburg, something called Col uh, Marburg Colloquy between Luther and Zwingli to try to work out their differences um, in terms of coming to a conclusion. They never can. And this will be a big distinction between, in general, the magisterial reformers break down into two camps, the Lutherans who follow Lutheranist theology, and then what we'll call the reformed tradition, Zwingli, and later on we'll get to John Calvin, who take that more of the idea that the Eucharist is, Protestant worship is more of a memorial of what happened rather than sort of, you know, making present of it again in the old Catholic way. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, Luther could be kind of, he could be kind of, well, he, he could be a jerk about this. He thought he was the only one who interpreted scripture right. One uh, uh, reformer, a former supporter of his later on, uh, nicknamed him, quote, the Pope of the Elbe for his sort of imperious attitude toward the rest of the reformers. Uh, and there were efforts, I'll get back to these in a moment, <clears throat> to try to work all this stuff out between uh, the reformers and the, uh, the Catholics. Uh, in particular, in 1529, I'll mention this. This is an imperial diet <clears throat> um, convoked not by Charles V. He went off to his other interests to, uh, to he was having to deal with fighting elsewhere in the empire. His brother, Maximilian, or is it Ferdinand? Excuse me, his brother Ferdinand, held a diet at Speyer in 1529, in which the, um, uh, the um, reformers issued a formal protest uh, apparently not having their ideas accepted. That's where you get, by the way, the, um, the, the word Protestant from. They're first called Protestants after 1529 and the Diet of Speyer. The next year, Charles V does hold a, um, he does hold a, a uh, <clears throat> another, um, another diet at Augsburg. And you're gonna have a, uh, a, a, comp a confession of faith thrown up by the reformers to try to um, try to reunite the two war in camps, Catholic and Protestant as a whole, but it gets rejected. It also gets rejected by some of the reformers. Vingley has nothing to do with it. And so this, this is the confession that will become the cornerstone of what we call Lutheranism. The Lutheran princes, the Lutheran theologians of Germany will get behind this. It'll become the formation for a lot of their doctrine up to this day. But also from a very early period, you have people taking, I've already hinted at this, taking Luther's ideas in a much more radical direction than he ever would. Uh, as soon as he comes back to Wittenberg, actually comes back to Wittenberg before he comes back officially in 1522 to deal with people that are called the uh, Zwickau prophets. These are people who um, came from Zwickau to Wittenberg, claiming the Holy Spirit was speaking to them directly and giving them alone guidance and stuff like this. He came back to rebuke them because he didn't like this idea at all. And um, you're gonna have increasingly, uh, the, it's called the Radical Reformation for a reason, people taking you know, his ideas and going in much you know, further directions with them. Again, people like Andreas Karlstadt, Thomas Munzer was associated with the, uh, the Peasants' War all make uh, possession of the Holy Spirit, the main foundation of religious truth. Um, again, more important than the Bible, right? So you're going that, Luther never left that behind, even though he's appealing to his own impersonal experience against the Catholic church. They're going, hey, well, that, this is, you know, this is the main thing that is your personal experience of this. And Luther had no trouble with that. <clears throat> and some went even so far, one guy named Hans Denk went so far as to say the Bible is no longer necessary. So it could get pretty, it could get pretty, um, yeah, it could get pretty radical some of the things they're doing. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is also bound up with um, iconoclasm, the destruction of images and churches. Uh, Catholics, of course, like Orthodox venerate images. And um, wherever you have popular enthusiasm for the Reformation, you get iconoclasm. Again, this, this happened in Wittenberg when Luther was away. Luther was not in, uh, in uh, favor of this. He didn't like the veneration of images, but he thought they were useful and helpful and he liked them. He had kind of an artistic sensibility. He wrote hymns, as you'll see from your, when you do your, um, your musical uh, assignment, uh, he wrote a famous hymn. But, um, but pretty much uh, the rest of the reformers have no truck with this. Karl Stott, Zwingli, John Calvin especially, will take the, um, 
take the line from the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, not having any graven images, uh, to mean that that's what Catholics do is idolatry. And this is connected with a deep sense of that Catholic worship is idolatrous among the reformers. Um, they'll think of the, the, the Catholic mass as being an idolatry. This will play into a lot of the religious violence of the period, because they'll go around destroying churches and also desecrate altars and stuff like this, the, the popular excesses of these things. And um, and so, we're, in fact, wherever there's 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 conflict in uh, in Europe over the Reformation, a lot of times there's going to be iconoclasm either before or after. Starts in Zurich in the 1520s and in in, the, uh, in Basel late 1520s, Copenhagen 1539, Munster, the siege of Munster in 1534, which we'll get to Geneva 1535, Scotland before its revolution in 1559. Um, uh, France in the 1560s before their wars of religion start. Um, you also have a major um, bout of uh, iconoclasm in the Netherlands before its revolt against Spanish rules, the Low Countries. And Gins and Amsterdam sweeps the rest of the northern uh, provinces of the Netherlands. Uh, it's called the Bielden Storm. Um, they just start destroying statues of the monastery in, uh, uh, in Amsterdam. And so it's uh, sets off in some ways the uh, political revolt. So it has, you know, both social and political connotations as iconoclasm. And you can think of this, by the way, I am thinking of this. You think of the current, you know, um, I don't know what you call it, vogue for taking down statues. Um, this kind of stuff precedes revolutions, French Revolution, Russian Revolution. Uh, you know, this is today with the, you know, wokeness and everything, the idea that there's something superstitious about the past, I doubt, but not more than that, there's something dangerous about the past, we have to wipe it out. Um, there's even been, there was a, a scholar years ago named James Alice who wrote a book called um, Under the Hammer, Iconoclasm in the Anglo-American Tradition, who sees this as being fundamental for, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, American political and social life, this idea we have to wipe away the past in order to, you know, move into a great new future or whatever. It's this sort of revolutionary thing that's definitely um, involved in all this. But the most radical of the reformers were people that would come to be called the Anabaptists. And they're radical because mm -hmm. uh, they reject lots of things that everybody else basically embraced. They reject, for example, any sort of any sort of um, alliance between church and state. And that's something that's not gonna be popular until much later in this course. Uh, they can have no truck with that, you know, no between the world and the church in their mind. Uh, a lot of them are intensely millenarians. So we'll get into, we'll get to the siege of Munster in a second. Um, they have millenarian, they think the end of the world's coming soon. Although even mainstream reformers like Luther and Zwingli were kind of influenced by this. But they take it a much more, much more literal way, uh, and it started in in uh, in Switzerland in the 1520s. Uh, people who you know took the Bible deadly literally. One of the things they took literally, and the most important thing they took, and that's where you get their name from, from the Bible, is there's no evidence for for infant baptism in in the New Testament, and so they reject this. And this is probably the most inflammatory thing they embrace that and the separation, you know, in church and state. Uh, and Anabaptist means rebaptizer, and they think that basically anybody who's not baptized as an adult. The reason, the reasoning is besides the biblical, uh, biblical reasoning, is that you have to give your assent as an adult. You have to give your, you know, you have to give your your full control. You can't give it as an infant. You know, that's why you have godfathers and godmothers and Catholicism and stuff. If somebody stand in for you, that idea of intercession is powerful in that religion. Here, they're like, no, this is all wrong. But of course, when you say that, what you're saying is that everybody else is not baptized and therefore is damned to hell uh, unless they get re unless they get rebaptized, which of course that pisses everybody off. And so both Protestants and Lutheran princes in Germany will have they will they will persecute Anabaptists worse than any, any other group basically in the entire history of the Reformation. And the Anabaptist church, by the way, this is the this is the where eventually the Mennonites come from and the Hutterites and people like that, if you know what you know what those are. So it comes out of this tradition. And we used to think, by the way, Anabaptists were all like those later Mennonites or a pacifist, or a lot of them are anyway. Um, that was not the case early on with a lot of these, these Anabaptists. A lot of them fought in the, the, the Peasants' War in the 15, 1524, 1525. Uh, and again, again, Luther, you know, 
encourage the authorities to, to, to sort of wipe these guys out. Maybe even more of a challenge uh, from this was the Siege of Munster uh, in 1534, 1535. A group of Anabaptist leaders seized the city there and proclaimed a sort of biblical utopia, uh, declaring that the millennium was at hand, but also began sanctioning all sorts of weird stuff like polygamy, uh, the leader whose name I don't have here, I cannot remember his name, um, uh, who led this group, proclaimed polygamy to be acceptable, started taking multiple wives. Why? It's in the Bible, in the Old Testament, obviously. When they, uh, um, when they began to um, uh, be laid siege to by both, and this is the thing, Lutheran and Catholic princes actually join up to lay siege to the city. The leaders in the city started executing their opponents, and the event they they eventually overcame them. Uh, and rebel leaders were tortured to death and their bodies left to rot in cages. I want to say for years on end, it was just gruesome what they did to them, which is giving an idea of how serious they took this. Um, uh, and again, how much of a threat this, this you know, Milnarian uh, craze could be. And again, just to give you an idea of how, you know, worship changed, how things changed overnight in the Reformation. This is the uh, it's a painting from the 1650s, 1550, I think. Uh, of the new Kirk, the new church of Amsterdam. I'll give you an idea. This is a medieval church. Started in the late, late 14, yeah, late 1400s. Um, it was damaged by fire in the 1530s, I think, from all the conflict there, but they rebuilt it. As you can see, it's kind of built in Gothic style, but you can see what they've done. Um, they've taken the altar out. Again, this is a you know, Protestant reformed church now. And the center, instead of where everybody goes to in the church, is not the altar, but the pulpit. You can see everybody there listening to a sermon. Um, the whole spatial aspect of, of, uh, of worship changes because of this. Again, the changing of space, the changing of ideologies, changing of religion. Uh, ideology is too harsh a word, but you get the idea um, from that painting there. Where at the same time, we'll get to the Council of Trent here in a little bit. Um, Catholicism will come out of this uh, Catholic Church will and reaffirm its basic teaching. This is a church built in Munich, St. Michael's Church, 1880 something, 84, 84, uh, built around that anyway. The Baroque Church, uh, Jesuit Church, if I'm not mistaken, this beautiful Baroque. Well, you can see how different it is. I'll show you in a second. All these images, they, there are, of course, four images. And of course, all this leads up to what is the main event. You have a pulpit here, by the way. There's preaching in these things, but it's off the side because it's not as important. You have side chapels on the side too. But the main thing, of course, is the the the, the mass, which they take to be a sacrifice, right? So you have a massive high altar. If you really believe that the body and blood of God Himself comes down during this, you have a magnificent. You can't make that magnificent enough if you believe this. And they do, and. Um, all that stuff there in the front's new, <laughs> but the, the old part of which we're going to focus on there. Uh, and so it can show you how the orientation is so different. Uh, and it'll be re-emphasized by Catholics in response. This we'll get to in a second. And just to give you again, this is an image of the Bielden storm, 1566. Painting of it. And again, uh, Dutch going around, destroying images, getting rid of, uh, again, what they think to be Again, almost like this contagion. Again, that's why I compared it to the sort of the vogue for getting rid of statuary and stuff. That's what it's treated like. Uh, and that's something, as we'll see next time, as I'll talk about the, you know, things like the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre. It's in the context of this sort of religious conflict. All uh, that stuff uh, take, uh, takes on this, this, uh, this uh, extreme life. Uh, and just to give you, again, where all this goes eventually. The Lutherans, by the way, their church would look different than this and then, you know, reform because the reform is much more austere. But of course, uh, reform Protestantism is more or less the, 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 the uh, progenitor of, of more or less of Protestantism in the United States, especially in the colonial era. And this is a colonial meeting house, congregationalist meeting house which is from the reform tradition. Just to show you how sparse it is, you take a look what this is. It's literally just a meeting house uh, whose main, who, all you have are pews and then a pulpit and nothing anywhere, no images, just the word. The only images that were allowed in colonial churches in America that were um, um, Protestant like that would be images of the Bible or the Ten Commandments. That's it. No crosses, something like that. That's how much they wanted to get rid of the old stuff, the old regime. And so as it keeps uh, spreading across uh, 
uh, just to give you an idea of how the Reformation spread in the empire, you kind of hinted this already, but uh, you're going to have, again, Luther appealing to the authorities or in you know, places like Switzerland, you'll have civic authorities, you know, city authorities taking over functions from the church. And one thing to note about this is that this is, it's again, it's how it happens and it wouldn't have happened without that. It is, it is, must be noted, especially in the empire, that part of this was happening anyway in the late Middle Ages. That is to say, the takeover of church property, functions of the church from the state, very slowly by kings, by monarchs, by civic organizations. As part of that, that process of state building that I mentioned in my first lecture, they're already kind of doing this. What Luther's ideas are, in some ways they're used as an excuse, because they've already done this in, in the latter part of the Middle Ages. In the empire, for example, under the pretext of reforming the church, they take over stuff or what they want, personnel, property, stuff like that. Uh, this gives them a, a genuine theological rationale for doing it. And so that's why this becomes part of the reason it accelerates what princes already want to do in a lot of ways. And so that's one thing. If you're also wondering, by the way, because if you're wondering, you know, how many, how many of, the, of these medieval peasants really know what Luther's ideas are or can understand them, we're not really sure. There's probably probably a good many of them, and he certainly thought the peasants were the peasants involved in that misunderstood his ideas. In some places, they did. They kind of made it seem like uh, did the reformers in Germany that things had stayed the same. Just to give me an example. Luther almost immediately started saying because the Catholic liturgy back then was in Latin. He almost immediately started saying uh, the liturgy in German, language of the people. But in certain places in Germany, like they 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 changed they changed the nature of the liturgy, but they didn't change the language. Like in certain big cathedrals, they kept it in Latin for for as long as a couple of decades. Again, to, to, to change it without letting people know it was changed. You might not have known things had changed if you were in a rural area in Germany. Um, this could have been done to you without your without you knowing it. In fact, so um, this will happen as I get to in a moment in England to a certain degree. And so the same thing happens in uh, Scandinavia. They embrace Lutheranism. There's not really a lot of you know, a lot of the same problem. There's not, there's no big outcry against indulgences in in Scandinavia, um, but Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Norway all embraced Lutheran ideas in the 1530s. Um, excuse me, um, but Lutheran ideas will actually make their way um, as far east uh, in, uh, as Hungary in Transylvania in the course of the 16th century. In fact. Uh, later on, reformed ideas have become uh, a, a part of uh, Hungarian life. You don't know the current uh, president of, uh, of Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, is actually a Calvinist. So the legacy of the Reformation, which is otherwise a Catholic country, or very practicing one, but still a Catholic country, but still got into their Transylvania, the land of Dracul, uh, Vlad Tepes, uh, and Poland. In fact, Poland for a long, for a good part of the, fourth, the 16th century, if you don't know this, was actually, I was actually a Protestant, almost a Protestant country, actually. It was so dominant. And the reason why is the, the nobility had lots of rights vis a vis the king there as an elected monarchy, and uh, they shielded them from any sort of uh, persecution. So uh, it's only later on during the Counter Reformation they actually win Poland back to Catholicism. And of course, you have something a little more unique um, the Reformation in England which kind of has to do with the king's great matter, quote unquote, that being the matter that Henry VIII, the Tudor king, whose father had won, uh, would been the last man standing in the Wars of the Roses, comes to the throne. He marries the, the bride that was intended for his, uh, uh, for, his, uh, for his brother. Once he dies, Catherine Baragon. But uh, they have a daughter, Mary, but he, she doesn't have any sons. And so he needs a male heir because he doesn't feel secure putting a woman on the throne. And so he tries to get out of his marriage to her, claiming that uh, she had already consummated her previous marriage to her brother. She denied this. She appeals to Rome because um, Henry is seeing an annulment. Annulment's a, a statement that the marriage was never valid in the first place. That's the difference between that and divorce. And uh, eventually, uh, and the Pope can't do this, by the way. Uh, he might have done this easily. I don't know. Uh, Clement the Seventh, uh, by 1527, he is a prisoner of Charles V, the King of Spain, the Holy Roman Emperor, who is the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, his Spanish wife. <laughs> so the Pope cannot grant him his uh, his annulment. So basically, 
um, he engages his parliament. Uh, parliament is on these medieval representative assemblies. I mentioned this the first lecture. You know, most of these kingdoms had them. By the time you get to the 17th century, they've all ceased to call them because monarchs are ruling on their own authority as absolute monarchs. Never get rid of theirs in England, partly because of what Henry does here, because he involves the realm in this. He thinks he needs the backing of, or at least the pretense of the backing of the of the of the people in this, and passes an act uh, in 15 passes a series of acts, but the big ones in 1533, the Act of Supremacy which basically states that this realm of England is an empire. By empire, he doesn't mean, you know, we've got colonies everywhere. He means a totally sovereign state where the Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction. So it says the language of the, of the act and uh, makes himself head of the church in England. Uh, and thereafter, uh, one of the things he does is uh, these monasteries and the mon monastic houses in England they they do have some problems, but mostly they they have two problems. One, they're really wealthy, makes them an easy target for criticism. Also means that Henry wants their money. And other problem is they are they have a specific they're under the jurisdiction of Pope, so they no longer have any reason to exist. And so he sends a series of visitations to uh, to these monasteries. Uh, finds that they are all seriously corrupt, of course, and then begins seizing their property and destroying them, uh, which he does over a period of four or five years. I think those are the right dates, maybe even longer than that, but um, basically rids the country of its monasteries, all of which, by the way, does not uh, enrich the, um, um, the, the monarchy in England uh, in the end. It eventually go into the coffers of his gentry and the nobility, nobility who sweep up these things because he immediately uses the money proceeds from that goes to fight a fruitless war against France. And so all, a lot of the property will exchange hands into that group of people. This will be, by the way, be the biggest, um, can I put this, government land grab. Uh, uh, that's what it is, it's a land grab uh, until I think the French Revolution so this is a huge amount of land. The church was a big landowner. They seize this land and it changes hands and basically ties the nobility and the gentry class of England to this reformation this way. But while he remains king, does it, uh, uh, Henry doesn't change much else. It's sometimes called his reformation, uh, Catholicism without the Pope. It goes a little farther than that, but you wouldn't know, other than the language changing, because it went from liturgy went from Latin to English, you wouldn't notice much. Again, in some places, they might have been still saying it in Latin, probably. This ended when he died, and his son, who was a child, came to the throne, Edward VI, who was raised a fervent Reformed Protestant, and his counselors proceeded to begin to actually turn the Church of England into a Reformed, truly Protestant body. They tried to impose changes. Oh, well, one of the changes they imposed is, a, is, a, is an English, again, English, all English liturgy. Um, the first All English Liturgy in 1549, uh, which uh, actually causes a rebellion. There's a rebellion in the South of England. Sometimes it's called the Prayer Book Rebellion, because that's what they call the new um, form of worship, the Book of Common Prayer. It's issued by the Church of England and their uh, its leader, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, who gave Henry his divorce. I forgot about that. I, I skipped over the divorce part. Yeah, he, he took over the church and granted himself a divorce. Um, Thomas Cranmer. Uh, had to have foreign troops kind of put the rebellion down. Uh, and so they're being pushed in the product direction. He dies, unfortunately, Edward VI in, in 1553, and his daughter Mary comes back, who been declared a bastard, and she's Catholic. She turns, we'll come back to this in a second, but uh, she's, you know, the one who executes a lot of Protestants. Uh, she'll die in 1558, when his other daughter um, uh, comes back, and Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth, and she'll restore, because, you know, Mary had brought back Catholicism, Elizabeth will restore a Protestant church, but one that uh, stops short of going where most continental Protestants are going. Uh, Elizabeth uh, famously re retains bishops. The Reformed tend to get rid of this idea that Lutherans still have bishops. Um, but the Reformed want a, want a more pure, biblical, biblically-based church. She keeps bishops. Um, there are actually a lot of other things. She doesn't make herself head of the Church of England. She calls herself governor of the Church of England. 
Um, even though she gets rid of the whole idea of the mass and stuff like that. Uh, it's sometimes called a, you know, a halfway house between, you know, Reformed and Catholic. It's not really. It is Protestant, but it's not a very loud one. There's a lot of things that are not doctrinal that are retained. Um, the dress that Church of England um, ministers wear will be a source of contention with, you know, the name Puritans who want further Reformation um, because they'll look kind of like Catholic priests a little bit. They'll wear you know, garb like that to distinguish them from laity. They um, they retain, this is one of the things they retain actually in the Church of England and elsewhere in Protestantism is a, um, a tradition of choral music. I mean, it like, may not sound like much, but really beautiful, you know, polyphony and stuff like that. O other places get got rid of, that's popish. Um, that's retained. Elizabeth likes that stuff. Um, she actually has a guy named William Byrd, who's a uh, composer, who's a Catholic working for her. So, um, so you have this yeah, Protestant-ish, I guess, maybe. Uh, or uh, or uh, Protestantism light being enforced by Elizabeth, who is not a fanatic. She is not a true believer. She is a Protestant, but much more um, politic. The word, actually a word for this in French in the 16th century, you're politique, meaning you were religious, but not too religious uh, in that regard. And as I kind of been hinting where the action is after the 1550s, especially, in Europe is with the reform rather than the Lutherans. The Lutherans become, you know, uh, creatures of the state church. So they're not as dynamic socially and uh, otherwise. In particular, because of one man, John Calvin. John Calvin was a humanist and a lawyer uh, who spent time in um, um, uh, who spent time uh, in uh, Paris. And uh, in the 1530s, as a uh, humanist working there, he was condemned by the University of Paris uh, for his work, uh, went to Basel in Switzerland, 1530s, and this pushed him toward Protestantism. And um, that's where he will publish uh, his major work. He published several editions of his lifetime, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. And he will, in 1536, be invited to the city of Geneva. <laughs> to help uh, reform the church there, where he'll become the major figure in the reformation of the death of Ulrich Zwingli in 1531. He dies in battle, does Zwingli, uh, in warfare. Uh, but he's actually resisted. Um, he actually is, um, um, they actually kick him out briefly. Uh, in 1538, he goes into exile in Strasbourg in uh, France. And so he finds refuge there. And there he uh, is a pastor of a church for um, the German Protestant city, by the way, Strasbourg, is the pastor of a church for French speaking refugees and lectures on the Bible. He gets married. Um, and he uses that experience to come back to, to Geneva in 1541, where he stays for the rest of his life and where he's in a much more um, secure position from then on. And the struggle um, to, uh, to really take control there lasts in the 1550s. After 1555, um, he is the predominant force uh, in Geneva. Um, but he turns it into the sort of Protestant Jerusalem in Europe. It'll be a refuge for Protestants who are being persecuted, especially in England from the reign of Mary in the 1550s. They'll come and find uh, 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 a refuge there. Uh, it'll also be the place where people were reformers they'll come to visit because they've been elsewhere. If you really want a pure reformation, even if you don't buy the Anabaptist separation of church and state, what you really want is a church that can direct the state. <laughs> um, it's a sort of, I, I, would, I could have called it a reformed Rome. Uh, it's definitely a reformed Christendom in miniature where the church calls the shots, not the state, where it's purified totally. Um, he sets up a, um, uh, a church there in, um, um, in uh, in Geneva, which you know, there's no bishops. There's there are there are hierarchy of you know elders and stuff like this, but it's all based on talent. It's not based on anything of this nature. And uh, in fact, uh, you have this you know with with Calvin a model you can follow. Luther was much more again the artist type, not really big on things like you know logical like thinking. <laughs> Uh, the law of non-contradiction didn't mean a whole lot uh, to Martin Luther, 
Whereas John Calvin has been called the, the Protestant Aquinas, which is quite a compliment, Thomas Aquinas, the great medieval theologian, because the institutes of the Christian religion lay out in a systematic way the teachings of the Reformation. And therefore, because it's systematic, you can copy it and take it elsewhere. It's one of the reasons why in, uh, in the latter part of the 16th century, wherever Calvinism goes, there is usually conflict <laughs> um, because it's a very aggressive, but it's also something people can model and follow. And so most of the conflicts, you know, Netherlands uh, versus, you know, uh, Protestants uh, revolt in the Netherlands, it's all Calvinists in, um, we'll get to this next time, the wars of religion. In, um, in France, it's Calvinism. In England, the Puritans are Calvinists. Uh, and so it's the dy dynamism of Calvin and the clarity of it that it can be repeated by others. And his city gives uh, an, an inkling of what that might look like, uh, a reformed Christendom where it's not, you know, state run. But by my pastors like him. <laughs> in, uh, in any case, um, what you have, um, and it's strange that it takes, I guess, so long for this to uh, for this to occur. You do have a couple of you have a lot of warfare, but I'm thinking mostly about uh, Germany here. You had the Peasants' War, the Siege of Munster in the 1530s. You have a couple other major uh, um, conflicts. There are a couple of rebellions. I mentioned the one in England during Edward the Sixth time, but the big one took place under Henry VIII when they first started uh, destroying the monasteries. There was a reaction against this in the north of England. Uh, called the Pilgrimage of Grace. And it's called a pilgrimage because that's weirdly what it kind of was. A bunch of, it's mostly ordinary people, but there were some few gentry leaders of this, organized what amounted to a Catholic pilgrimage in arms um, of 30,000 people. That's a, basically an army is what it is. And they marched down, they meet at York, which is a major city in the North. And they marched down to London to go present their petition to the king. And what, what, what they want is him to, they, they think evil counselors have convinced Henry VIII to go seize the monasteries, these poor pious people. That, that gives you an idea just how, how religious a figure the king was, these people. They couldn't believe the king who was God's anointed would do this to the monasteries. And their leader, Robert, Robert Ask, uh, who basically was the leader of this, they, they sent the, you know, a whole list of demands was to bring back them. And one, they wanted the monastery, but monasteries, by the way, for two reasons. One was religious, part of the community's life there in the north, but also it was, it was partly these, these monasteries in certain places in England were part of the economy there. And so it, was, it, it kind of, it, 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 it depressed the economy in these places. And so that was a dual sort of, um, a dual motivation. In any case, they, um, they make their way down and he has to, he, he has no army large enough in Southern England to deal with them. So he, he actually invites him to dinner over Christmas, talks to Robert Ast and says, yes, I'll have your concerns. Just let all your people go back home, which they do. Then six months later, somebody else in the North tries to rebel against Henry. He uses that as an excuse to go find all the leaders of the Pilgrimage of Grace and execute all of them, executed hundreds of people in the Pilgrimage of Grace. Henry VIII was a Machiavellian scumbag of the worst sort, but it worked. Because uh, if that army had actually, they could have easily destroyed the government. It's amazing this happened. And by the way, when I say a real pilgrimage, they marched, it's called the Pilgrimage of Grace because they marched under the banner <clears throat> This is a medieval thing of the five wounds of Christ. I wish I had the banner to show you the wounds, the wounds on this, you know, Christ was nailed to the cross in Christian belief. And you know, the, the hands, wounds from the nails in the hands and the feet and the, the side where the soldier pierced him with a sword. Uh, literally a religious pilgrimage. Been better if it had been a religious war for them anyway, if they had done that. Anyway, speaking of religious war, um, you know, war finally comes to Germany. 30 years, 1546, after, you know, um, after uh, Martin Luther's initial protest, uh, in 1546, between Charles V, the emperor, and the Lutheran princes, which he wins some battles, does Charles V, he wins one major battle, in Euclidburg is the name, of the name of the town, but he's simply not able to impose his will, even after he wins. So then they fight to a standstill in 1515. And finally, they sign a peace, the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, basically enshrining, you've probably heard this if you've studied this in high school at all, the, um, um, 
the doctrine of quius religio, a quius regio, aius religio. Basically, wherever, in whatever, and there's lots of thousands of princedoms and stuff in, uh, in uh, the empire, whoever the ruler is, that will be the personal religion of the ruler will be the ruler of the state. If it's a Protestant, then the country is a Protestant state. Even if like 95% of the Catholic nation's public, population is Catholic, I get that backwards. Uh, and in reverse, the prince is Catholic, then his 98% um, Protestant population is Protestant. It's the only way to keep the peace. It's a very grudging, it's not really, there's toleration, but it's very grudging. Uh, but it does keep the peace, at least for a time, uh, at the end of this war. So what was happening with the Catholic Church while this was going on? You might want to know, what were they doing? I mentioned kind of last time that their early attempts to deal with Luther were pretty pathetic. Uh, Pope issues a bull, but he ignores it. The bishops of Germany do nothing. Um, again, they're kind of caught flat-footed and they don't respond very well. What about the imperial response? Even after the 15, you know, after the initial, after 1521, why did Charles V not do anything? And well, the, the reason's pretty simple. Uh, and the reason is that he, and by he, I mean um, um, uh, the emperor, uh, was a little busy. And in particular, he was busy with, well, fighting wars elsewhere uh, against the French. And in the 1520s, he's in Italy fighting with the French. In 1526, the Ottomans uh, take, uh, make conquer so the southern part of Hungary. In 1529, they make it to the gates of Vienna. So we eventually, there's a nation of Abs Austria, right? This is, the Habsburg, this is the Habsburg's personal territory within the empire. So he's, he's got some things to deal with, which means he really can't. That's one of the reasons why he can't pressure those Lutheran princes like he wants to. He needs their help. So he can't do that. And um, on the one hand, uh, um, so he's tied up. So why does the papacy do more? Well, a couple of reasons. One, they do kind of need secular, they need the emperor to help them. This is a German problem to do these things. But the other reason, of course, is the papacy is kind of afraid what will happen if they do what everybody wants and call for a general council. They're not sure what's going to happen. Um, they, last time they called a general council that wasn't totally under them of a, pape, uh, of a pope, uh, they tried to inject this idea of conciliarism in the church. So the fears of this lead them to be really tentative. And of course, there's still a lot of corruption in the Curia, even after it begins to change, we'll get to this in a second, it begins to change slowly over time, um, definitely by the 1540s. But uh, again, it's a couple of decades after Luther's condemned. Nonetheless, there are, I've kind of told, I've talked about this already, um, there are attempts, there are a number of attempts, a number of meetings within the empire, a number of diets. I mentioned the one at Spire, I mentioned there's several. Um, the last one, I believe, is at Marburg in 1541. Um, there are, again, for a couple of decades, they tried. They had people like Philip Melanchthon, Luther's second in command, uh, was a you know, humanist, fairly tolerant guy, Irenic. Um, there are people on the Catholic side that want to do this, usually humanist-inspired Catholics who want to try to bridge the Gulf. It, it just, it, for a variety of reasons, once uh, things get started, by the 1530s, it's probably over. By 1541, it's probably definitely no longer possible for, for them to come, uh, come back from this. Uh, and so you're going to have those attempts come to nothing, unfortunately. And in fact, the, the impetus for reform comes again from outside the hierarchy, outside the places where you think it would come from. One of the most important of these, of course, is uh, the Society of Jesus, founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola, who was a Spanish soldier, who was wounded fighting in some of the wars of Spain, who in the, uh, um, in the uh, convalescing after a battle when he'd been wounded, uh, has nothing else to read but saints' lives. And while reading these saints' lives, he has this spectacular conversion. And so eventually he decides he wants to be a priest. He goes to Rome. And while there, he, he wants to, you know, found this new order. Uh, why? To kind of help combat Protestantism. And by the way, when he's there, his first few years there, he's kind of looked down with suspicion on, again, Rome isn't keen on reform at this point. <laughs> um, 
but eventually he does attract the attention of, of people who are, and there are increasingly from the 15, uh, late 1530s, actually, Paul III is a pope who begins appointing reformers cautiously to his curia, uh, and they will, he will attract patients, and eventually he is given, his order is given papal sanction in 1540. And they will become the shock troops of what's called the Catholic Reformation or the Counter Reformation, both. The different things, but they're both the same thing. Uh, they swear a special of obedience to papacy to fight for him. And uh, they also, of course, bowed up to, to do away with Protestantism. Uh, and they will become the, the troops, the frontline troops. It's very militaristic. This guy's a military uh, person. And his, the training he gives to his Jesuits is really intense. Um, they do um, something called spiritual exercises, which are these really intensive spiritual training meant to sort of break you down and build you back up, kind of like a boot camp um, for clergy, which makes them into really effective, well, really effective missionaries, administrators, educators. This is where they'll get their reputation. They'll become the front line of missionary work. Not only them, there's other religious orders, but for this Catholic Reformation, they're the sort of image of it. And in fact, they come very, very quickly very powerful. They have a, because they're so capable, they tend to, uh, one historian, Carlos Ear, so they have a, they have a tendency to sort of find their, find their way into places of, of, of uh, authority and power uh, throughout their history. Still, obviously, you know, Jesuit Pope. So um, they, and they'll become hated, even in Catholic circles, um, for those reasons going forward, but they will become part of this reform. But it's not till the 1540s that finally, finally they get their stuff together and the popes begin to call. They finally call for a general council, uh, which meets the, the city of Trent within, it's in Northern Italy, but it's in the, within the bounds of the empire because uh, they need to have the emperors to help them out to do this. And uh, they finally meet in 1545 and they begin dressing almost immediately in 1540s, the theological criticisms of the, in the first meeting, the first and second meeting, they do this, uh, won't go into much detail here. Um, they reassert, uh, again, um, the, um, the doctrine of um, salvation as they understand it, right? Not by faith alone, but faith, you know, but also requires works. Um, they condemn the Protestant one. That's what the whole thing's about, basically, in its doctrinal sense is the issue canons which give you the doctrine and they uh, anathematize um, the Protestant positions and uh, they reaffirm you know the, the Catholic mass you know prayers for the dead veneration of images all that stuff all the things that have been condemned by uh, Luther and the Calvin they, they, they affirm and they confirm that the Protestants are wrong um, it has to be sort of shut down a couple of times uh, meets over a period as you can see of 18 years uh, the first couple of sessions, partly because of warfare, uh, again, the emperor French, partly because of plague at certain times, shuts this down on uh, the 1540s and 1550s. Uh, it's pretty amazing that anything gets done. But probably the most important session is the la or per for, uh, last meeting after it's uh, recalled one, one last time in 1562, is that final meeting. And the reason why, as I mentioned earlier, that you began to have in the 1530s reformers getting into the hierarchy and especially into the curia. Uh, again, the papacy has been a mess, but they begin to tentatively put people because they don't want to change things too fast. People have a vested interest in the old order. What happens by the 1562 is you almost have an entirely new, because it's been so long since they started the council, an entirely new roster of bishops at Trent. And these people are all younger. They've all become bishops since the Reformation started. And they are finally dead set on getting rid of the abuses they think led to this. And it's in the last session they passed the practical reforms that will, that will re-energize the Catholic Church in Europe. They do away with, uh, with um, uh, bishops holding multiple benefices. That's gone, they have to reside in their dioceses. Um, one of the important things they do is they create seminaries. Uh, to weed out bad candidates for the priesthood, which they had never done before. I guess when you're a religious monopoly, you don't have to think about those things. But um, um, that, of course, will weed out the, uh, the worst of their candidates, give can uh, priestly candidates a better esprit de corps. Uh, and so 
um, uh, they get rid of the, the worst abuses of uh, uh, that led to the uh, Reformation. And it will have its effect. I'll talk about this more next time in the next couple of weeks when we talk about Baroque culture. Uh, it'll have an impact on culture, actually, at the Council of Trent, if you can imagine. Uh, but it will lead to its resurgence. Uh, again, it doesn't, it's too late to heal the breach. They actually invite, by the way, Protestant observers in the second session in the 1550s. Uh, nothing comes of it. Uh, the Protestants basically demand that they, the Pope give up any sort of authority. It's not going to happen. And so it's too late by then. But it does revitalize Catholicism in Western Europe. It will set the stage, by the way, for it becoming a global church. There's going to be great missionary work being done across the globe because of the Spanish Empire and other empires. So that will become part of this as well. One last sort of coda to this, uh, to this uh, Catholic response is the Marian experiment in England. Marian meaning, of course, Queen Mary. You probably know her as Bloody Mary from her reign. A religious policy, of course, meant, of course, um, enforcing very strictly policies against her Protestant heresy. And you had something like 284 people put to death uh, by Mary and her policy during her reign. It's usually thought that she was a doomed woman, and partly because she was unhealthy, poor health anyway. Um, there's this thought that her her persecuting policy didn't work; it was it was, you know, it was doomed to fail. Uh, the historian Eamon Duffy has made a, a pretty powerful argument that this is actually not the case. That if she had lived long enough, this probably would have wiped out Protestantism in Europe. Part of the reason she didn't live long enough, um, she died after a few years. Elizabeth lived for 45 years as monarch. Uh, but also it makes the argument that she actually, uh, she, especially her, especially her right-hand man, Cardinal Pole. Cardinal Pole was an English, uh, English cardinal who'd been at the first sessions of the Council of Trent. And he comes from Trent full of these new ideas. He undertakes a program of reform that sort of uh, anticipates some of the things that will happen after the Council of Trent. He sets up seminaries, more or less, they don't call them that, in England to train priests. Um, higher, uh, 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 provides for foundations for preachers to combat Protestant preaching. So again, this is this humanist inspired reform, which has some sympathy with some of the Protestant criticisms. And so it's not necessarily a, a, a turning of the clock back to the earlier earlier medieval regime. For example, when she becomes uh, becomes queen, one of the one of the things she can't do is give up back all the land that was taken from the church. That's gone. So um, Duffy's made the argument, this is actually a sort of forward looking regime in some ways. It gets tarred for obvious reasons. Although of course, you know, her successor Elizabeth executes over 180 uh, Catholics during her reign, but it was over a 45 year period. It was for treason. It was really for religious reasons, but it's called treason. So, but, uh, but even that's part of this uh, effort to reform the church uh, in the part, latter part of the century. Fitting, we end with Mary as we come into the next part, which is about women in the Reformation era. Um, going pretty long here. This is just showing the map of the breakdown of, of the Christian world by 1555, basically north south. You're going to see it, all the Greens, Catholic, uh, and you have the north, uh, you know, Britain, Scandinavia, northern Germany, eastern uh, Germany, then into, you know, parts of the Baltics up here parts of Poland, that's the uh, Lutherans down there, Poland, Hungary, Transylvania, and then in the center with Geneva and the Swiss. Uh, and so, and that's the breakdown with a bunch of, as you can see, as we'll get to this next time in the religious wars, lots of pockets of it in France. So there you go. So this brings us to women. Okay, why do I wanna do talk about women in the Reformation? Well, partly because then you give you an idea, just a, a good different perspective on this. It's a very male thing, the Reformation and religion that's mostly ma masculine. Still does involve women, obviously. And to give you just a, a, a different perspective on how this change affects everyone. I'm gonna show you something for a second. I said I'm talking about women. <laughs> and, and by the way, I'm calling them mighty fortresses. Not, that's not an insult. That's a reference to the Lutheran hymn. Luther's hymn, uh, mighty fortresses are God. So, um, Anyway, you get the idea, women reformers in this time period. But take a look for a moment at Leo X. This is the Pope, who's the Pope at the time. Uh, Luther starts his reformation. Medici Pope, Florentine. <clears throat> I believe one of these gentlemen, I can't remember which one, is his nephew. So yay, nepotism. Uh, but notice uh, the picture, you know, the very reserved picture of these cardinals. Uh, take a look at their faces and just see if you can't catch 
the difference. I'm going to show you some pictures of the some of the major Protestant reformers in the 16th century. Counterclockwise here, just going from right to left. Thomas Cranmer, 1547, the leader of the, uh, the Reformation in England, Archbishop of Canterbury. This is uh, John Calvin, you know, the leader of the Reformed Protestants in Geneva. This is Heinrich Bullinger, 1550, another Protestant reformer. And then Theodore Abeza, another Reformed Protestant who was on good terms with uh, Cranmer as one of many other reformers. You're pretty sharp people, so I know you know you noticed what's different, of course, they're all wearing beards. And you probably noticed all the cardinals in Rome wore clean shaven faces. Why am I pointing this out to you? Well, some historians have kind of hinted at the fact that, you know, you could possibly see the Reformation as a revolt against the, you know, mother church, right? The, uh, the dominant, the overbearing, you know, you could call it nanny state church in the Middle Ages, which dominates everything. And the assertion of this masculine identity, again, these, you know, against these effeminate celibate priests. Again, priests sometimes got a bad reputation in the Middle Ages for being effeminate, being, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So there's this assertion of manliness, these, you know, got these big beards and everything, kind of a weird thing, but you can almost kind of see it in those terms. And it certainly plays itself out in doctrinal terms, because of course, the big, one of the big changes for women that comes directly out of, out of the Reformation is, that um, there's no more religious life. There are no more nuns, there are more convents and stuff like this. They reject the idea of thou liver to the life altogether, do Protestants. And um, it's also the end, of course, of Marian devotion. It's kind of interesting for, uh, because, in fact, Martin Luther, he denied, you know, um, veneration of Marian the way Catholics did, but he, he never really, um, he never, he, he still uh, believed in, for example, the perpetual virginity of Mary. It's pretty medieval in his thinking. Even John Calvin thought it was an acceptable opinion. It's only after, I guess, after their yeah, first generation of products, Protestants get born into it, they get rid of this altogether. But all the sort of, you know, man, iconography, hymnody, and all that stuff that made, at least had this highly idealized, unrealistic image of a, a femininity that you, that, you, uh, that you revere goes away. It's a big change in a lot of ways. And in fact, um, the end of religious life it used to be seen, um, uh, the Reformation, uh, older historiography, it was, it was this big, uh, you know, big uh, forward march for women, right? Get away from the patriarchal, you know, religious life thing, um, be freed from, uh, freed from celibacy and all this stuff. And um, in fact, in earlier times, they tended to overdo how egalitarian some of these radical, Protestant groups were, some of them were kind of, but not really, most of them never really embraced the idea that women and were equal in social terms. Uh, and in fact, for the most part, historians tend to see the Reformation as more ambivalent for women uh, for a lot of reasons. One is because, you know, religious life, you know, if you were an abbess, if you were a, you ran a convent, you had some authority. Um, it's a big enough, wealthy enough convent, it'd be, you could have authority over men. Uh, potentially. Uh, it was an avenue for women, and you could be poor and go to the convent and, you know, rise your way up through there, just like people did in monasteries. Uh, and uh, it's also an, uh, an avenue, religious life in monasteries. It's one of the only places you can get educated as a woman in the Middle Ages. Uh, and of course, you're still getting Catholic. And, and, and most were dull, obviously. But it sort of cuts that off totally uh, from uh, the Protestant world. So it's kind of this it's loss and gain. It's not really necessarily a, a great thing uh, in many respects. And so, in fact, what you have is a change, uh, definitely a change in terms of, um, you know, uh, marriage and family life because of different beliefs in uh, in um, in Protestantism, in medieval Catholicism. Of course, um, they tended to think that the life of, of a perpetually um, sexually continent monk or priest was superior to that of a layman. Uh, that the denial of the body, denial of sex, the denial of the body was um, uh, a good thing in and of itself. And sex was seen as sinful, though it wasn't totally evil, it couldn't be. God had created the body as originally good. Um, Protestants, Protestants reject all that, of course. Uh, and so they, they see it as either impossible or, or harmful or both, and see marriage as the only real, sort of real state you can have. Some like Luther even basically said that the most important rationale for sex was not procreation, which is virtually every 
uh, most Catholic authors, although they, they, they acknowledge a little more broadly in the early modern period that yes, sex is good for spousal affection, but Luther emphasized that a lot actually. Um, it's also exemplified by the fact that uh, for the first time divorce is possible uh, in Protestant countries. And I say possible, it's still really frowned, but it's only for certain reasons, adultery, impotence, stuff like that. And like there are very, very, very few divorces in Protestant countries, uh, either on the continent or or in the, the UK and going forward. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, nope. Um, and so you have this shift in uh, in ideals of domesticity, in which Gus with that stop it. Gus, stop. <laughs> Gus, come here, buddy. Come here, buddy. I know, I know. Uh, anyway, yeah, somebody's on the door. Sorry, next door. Um, <laughs> where were we? Uh, domesticity. One thing they did have to do was craft a uh, sort of identity for themselves, a lot of these Protestant women, because a lot of them came in married. We're now pastors, right? They can get married. They weren't celibate anymore. Uh, Katarina von Bora, most, probably most famously, was a former nun, married Martin Luther. They had a bunch of kids. Um, most of the Protestant reformers will marry uh, uh, after um, after uh, leaving, uh, breaking with the medieval church, uh, and so you'll have this, you know, um, this uh, uh, this situation in which women basically again they kind of only have that sort of space within the home afterwards, which again they do craft a role there. Protestant pastor wives, pastors wives can be very important, but um, maybe a little more limited than we used to think. Then finally, one thing I have to mention briefly because it is part of this uh, time frame. Uh, of course, it's in the early modern period where you have the great witch craze in uh, in Western Europe, late Middle Ages into about you know 1650, 1700 or so. And I mention it because it falls mostly on women. It doesn't fall totally. Um, about 85% of people executed for witchcraft at the in the early modern period are uh, are, are women. The other 15% are actually men. But it doesn't confuse you. Uh, and the numbers, by the way, are, are not really sure, but it's between 40 and 60,000 over a period of a couple hundred years. I mention it partly because of the gender breakdown, but also partly because it probably has something to do with the, the social tensions introduced by the Reformation. Uh, and in fact, there's differences between, you know, where people get, you know, where the, the persecution is the worst. Just give an example, in Scandinavia and places like Russia, it's actually more men than women that get executed for witchcraft, if you can imagine. Uh, whereas in Western Europe, it's mostly in places like France and England and the Western states, where a lot of the, the persecution for witchcraft goes on. All, by the way, in secular courts there, um, places like, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, and, so, uh, and so for the most part in secular courts, law courts. Uh, I say that because there are a few areas of Western Europe where there are almost no women burn, feel executed for witchcraft, which are um, Spain, Portugal, and in the states of Italy. And if you're wondering why, that's because they had the Inquisition in those places. If you heard me correctly, the Inquisition. You know what the Inquisition is? This is the, you know, this is the, it's not an institution, there's, there's a Roman Inquisition, but it's the idea of setting up a tribunal for, you know, trying heresy. It has a bad reputation because of the Spanish in Inquisition, but um, they only executed, I think, one person in Portugal over a span at the same time span, more like a couple in Spain, none in Italy. The reason is for a couple of reasons. One is they had higher standards for evidence for things like witchcraft in, in uh, inquisitorial courts, uh, but they also didn't see it the same way. Uh, in, in elsewhere in Europe, they didn't just see witchcraft as being a matter of demonic, and therefore something actively, I guess could undermine, undermine the state because it happened in you know, secular law courts, civic law courts. Whereas they didn't see it that way in the uh, inquisitorial courts because they saw it as more as being sort of false, harmless false magic. They just basically sent people home with a warning. So it's kind of odd, but it's interesting how this breaks down in the same time frame, in the era of Reformation. And there were reformers. There were women who did actually participate in the process of reform, Protestant and Catholic in the same era. I mentioned a couple here briefly. Uh, Marguerite, de, Marguerite de Navarre, a French-speaking uh, princess, actually is the brother of the King of France, Francis I, who became a patron of reformers, both Protestant and Catholic, actually. 
a humanist, uh, well-educated like her brother was. That's probably the only place you could get at such an education, but she did. Uh, wrote poetry, a uh, 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 poem about uh, uh, her religious beliefs, uh, and was, remained on good terms with most of the Protestant reformers, but also Rome, and never, like Erasmus, never quite left the Catholic Church, stayed in her entire life. I mention this because um, she is um, sometimes linked with a, um, a, uh, uh, another reformer named Marie Dantier, who was a noblewoman uh, who left her convent. And most of these reformers, by the way, are going to be, again, they're going to be noble women. Again, it didn't, the Reformation didn't do a whole lot for ordinary women this way. It's mostly people who already have status who can do this. Uh, she'd been an abbess. She left her, her abbey in Tournai in 1521 and uh, goes and marries a, um, uh, a preacher, a guy named Fromont, Jacob Fromont, who um, uh, eventually makes his way to Geneva to work with John Calvin where she will write uh, a, um, uh, a history of, of the uh, Reformation in Geneva. Uh, it's a very uh, striking figure. While she's in Geneva, by the way, one of the things she does is she will actually go into, um, she will go in because there are still convents there. She goes into a Franciscan convent and basically harangues the nuns there to try to get them to leave. Uh, which by the way, they all reject her. They can't stand her. They try to get her away from her. She brings Protestant ministers into this into this convent try to get them to leave. They eventually wind up leaving the Franciscans because of this harassment. But give you an idea of how this this kind of brings down the the local level this conflict. Um, but she also writes a letter to Marguerite of Navarre, and she writes this trying to convince her to become Protestant. And again, I mentioned this last time with Lutheran Erasmus, just to give you an idea. This conflict went went, yeah, went on between people who were both reformers but not all of them left you know, the Catholic Church. Uh, it's a notable letter. It, was, it, was, it disappeared shortly after it was published. It's notable because it was rediscovered in the 19th century, but it's notable because she lays out the themes, you know, you can get this from any other reformer, you know, why the Catholic mass is idolatry, why you need to come back to the Bible, all these other things. But it's, uh, but it's notable because it uh, contains a short, you know, it's like three or four pages long, uh, defense of women. And it is the only, she is the only person I know of in the Reformation era. She, our women have a right to preach the gospel and teach it and interpret scripture equal to men. Um, it's not exactly a manifesto for total equality, but in religious terms, it is. It's pretty straightforwardly that. Um, and um, it, really the first, I guess the first French, truly French, truly, um, yeah, one of the first you know, reform, women reform theologians. It's a pretty amazing person in a lot of ways. You also have reformers on the Catholic side, which we'll show a moment. I mentioned Marguerite de Navarre. It's a picture of her in 1527 or roundabouts. If you've ever seen, by the way, her brother Francis I, she looks just like him. Um, there are Catholic reformers, uh, uh, women reformers on the Catholic side. Uh, a couple of them, Isabel Rosse, I guess Rosse, you pronounce the Spanish. Uh, again, another noble woman who supported Ignatius of Loyola uh, when he came to Rome, uh, helped you know supply them. She actually started a wanted to start a a a uh, a, um, a a woman's order of of the Jesuits. Uh, gathered a couple of supporters to her. You know, did things like help the poor, educate girls, and stuff like this. Uh, Ignatius of Loyola reacted horribly to this. He got Paul the Third, the Pope, uh, to squash it. Uh, and so, but her, 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 her group of, her group of lay women started, you know, teaching anyway, but uh, again, kind of an interesting figure because he got squashed by Ignatius of Loyola. Did, and by the way, one of the reasons why he didn't want this is because when she started bringing women into, into the same, I guess, I guess into the same order as men, they started getting quote unquote distracted. <laughs> and so I guess that, that is a reason why <laughs> you're taking vows of celibate might be distracted by women. Um, but also women like, uh, there are others I could mention, but I mentioned Luisa de Carvajal y Mendoza um, because she is uh, a rare person, another you know, Spanish noblewoman who uh, rare us to rarity, they did not let women do this. She became a missionary to England, to Protestant England in the 15, 15, uh, 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, she used her family fortune uh, to found a college for English Jesuits uh, in uh, in was today Belgium, the Spanish Netherlands back then, and um, she went to England in 1605 um, to 
carry out under the protection of the Spanish embassy there um, to go try to convert Protestants. She would literally go into the street. She There's a, light, a really interesting letter. She talks about going to Cheapside, Cheapside's an area of London, and, and, and basically preaching to Protestant shop owners. And then people like, you know, like getting people like a crowd around her and having to get out of there. It's pretty funny. She's trying to convert these Anglicans. Um, but again, rare things you actually have. Um, and this is, there's others, mostly founders of orders. Women like St. Teresa of Avila. She's the most famous one. <clears throat> um, uh, nun, mystic, uh, spiritual writer, very famous saint. Uh, was declared a doctor of the church. I um, uh, don't remember which pope did this, but doctor's a, 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 um, a teacher, uh, a sort of a recognized, you know, saintly teacher in the church. Um, Merchant's daughter is probably the only non-noble woman on that list, uh, essentially that I that I um, that I um, um, I've, I've listed so far. Very famous because she tried to reform her order, the Carmelites, and encountered a lot of opposition from the head of her order. Um, from local authorities, um, and in fact, she had a, 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 a um, her friend in this was another Carmelite monk, Carmelites of religious order, Catholic Church, uh, named John of, John of Avila, John of the Cross, he's sometimes called another saint. Uh, he was actually put in prison by his own order, and the reason why, by the way, what, what, what they were why they were so opposed is they they wanted to return their order to its original strictness, which meant being impoverished, being poor. Again, some of these convents were wealthy. <laughs> they didn't want them to do this. Uh, the King of Spain actually stepped in, I think it was Philip III, and actually put, put this to, a, to bed in the 1570s. And uh, her spiritual writings became vastly famous throughout Europe, uh, even though in their lifetime, definitely after her lifetime because of this. Then I'd also, I'll wrap this up briefly to I'll talk about before I well, uh, get to the end here, but you also have, um, you also have women, uh, Monarchs, uh, of course, in the 16th, 17th century, that's one of the few ways you can have this. And of course, uh, before Reformation, there had never been any women monarchs in the history of, well, the British Isles, as far as I can tell. And of course, you have Mary, and you have Elizabeth I, uh, who becomes, of course, the great sort of figure of female monarchy. And of course, you probably know about Mary, Queen of Scots, Scottish Queen, uh, eventually had to be executed by Elizabeth because she became a lightning rod, she remained Catholic. Um, but you also have people like Catherine de' Medici, the Florentine princess who married into the French crown. We'll get this a little more next week in the wars, wars of religion. Uh, the king dies and she becomes queen regent for many years of the French state. Uh, as does, as a queen regent, Jeanne d'Albret. And Jeanne d'Albret is the, uh, well, be the queen mother of the kingdom of Navarre, which is to say she's the daughter of the queen of Navarre, Marguerite de Navarre. I mentioned her because she will, unlike her mother, will become a fervent Protestant and will raise her son, Henri, Henry, uh, as a Protestant. Henri will become the king eventually of France at the end of this period and convert back to Catholicism. So again, they can have influence this way. And then royal consorts, uh, again, queens who are queens, but they don't rule in their own right. You probably know who Anne Boleyn is. Anne Boleyn, of course, is the love of Henry VIII's life. Of course, he cut her head off because he's Henry VIII. Uh, but she was, of course, a Protestant. She, she promoted Protestant interests at court. She had influence that way. And then, of course, Catherine of Aragon, um, the poor woman sort of cast aside by Henry VIII. Uh, she, by the way, was, a, a, was a, like Marguerite and Navarre, uh, educated by humanists, a very uh, famous Spanish humanist, Juan uh, Vives. Um, she's universally admired by modern historians for her learning and for her uh, and for her fortitude and what she went through and everything. So they can have influence that way as well at the top of the food chain. But finally, one of the other things you could do, of course, in the 16th century, if you really, really, really believed, is become a martyr. And there were women martyrs during the, the history of the Reformation in the 16th um, and 17th centuries. Uh, one of those famous in, uh, these are both from English history. This is uh, a martyr of Anne Askew who was executed under uh, Henry VIII's reign in 1546 for a Protestant belief. She, we know this, by the way, because she wrote a, an account of her, well, being tortured. Uh, she was put on the rack uh, by Henry VIII's torturers. Uh, and yes, torture was used. It wasn't used uniformly throughout uh, Western Europe. It, was, um, it wasn't supposed to be legal in the latter part of the 16th century in England, they used it anyway. Uh, 
torture was <clears throat> uh, legal in most countries in Europe because they derived their system of law from Roman law and Roman law may allow for use of torture uh, in, um, in those settings. This is a scene from the death of Margaret Clitheroe, St. Margaret Clitheroe, was a Catholic uh, martyr in 1586 in England in during the penal, so-called penal times, Catholics call the times when Catholicism was outlawed in England or made illegal, uh, where she was literally pressed to death. Bags of rocks were put on her until her, she got crushed. Uh, this was a rare thing. They didn't do this in England very much. This was local authorities that did this, but I'll come back to her in a second. Uh, that's Margaret Clitheroe. Um, just to set the stage here for a second, um, the, um, the biggest number of uh, women martyrs, of course, come from the Anabaptists because they were the most persecuted. Everybody hated them because of their beliefs uh, about baptism and other things. And because, of course, since they eschewed any alliance with the state, they had no protectors. So they were easier prey than anybody else. Uh, most, uh, we're not really sure how many were executed, somewhere between two, two and three thousand it's hard to say uh most in the empire the low countries or uh switzerland or bohemia in those countries and of these it's estimated between 20 and 30 percent were women which is by far the highest proportion of women who died for their faith either by execution or by dying in prison uh, in some regard uh in the uh, in the English Reformation, of course, you also had Protestant martyrs. Um, there, were, there were a couple who were martyred. Uh, I know, uh, I think, well, there's obviously Anne Askew uh, in her reign, uh, in Henry VIII's reign, maybe one or two others. But um, most of the uh, women who were executed were executed, of course, during the reign of Queen Mary, uh, during her reign. Of the 284 people she executed, 45 were women. It's a real high percent, 15%. So almost as high as uh, the Anabaptist martyrs. Um, and most of these people were wondering why it was so high. This seemed to be mostly at the end of Mary's reign when I guess the, the uh, machinery of persecution had cranked up really high. It, most of them seemed to be people who were like servants or widows or spinsters, people who had little protection legally and socially speaking. That tends to happen when you do that. And then finally, there were also Catholic martyrs in the era of, well, in the 16th and 17th centuries in England. Um, some 600 Catholics were executed or died in prison uh, in those centuries. Uh, oftentimes, by the way, for offenses as slight as getting papal permission to marry, um, it can be pretty, it can be intense at times. Uh, and one of the interesting things about the, the penal times in England is that women played a very vital role in keeping Catholicism alive because it existed mostly uh, in secret in the houses of gentry, cla uh, gentry class Catholics in the countryside or nobility because uh, they had the, the legal authority and the, the clout to shield them. And so uh, wives who sheltered, and this is where you get things like, you know, if you, you still find uh, in country houses in England, priest holes, where, you know, you have priests dive into these holes to, to, to escape uh, detection in the 17th, 16th, 17th centuries. Uh, mental support of women was crucial to this. However, comparatively few Catholic women ever suffered martyrdom. I mentioned uh, Margaret Clitheroe, probably the most famous. Uh, she was a, and she was famous because she was a convert. She'd been a Protestant. Uh, she converted against her husband's wishes. Her husband was a Protestant. And she actually was, uh, for, I mean, late 1570s, so a better part of a decade, she was helping Protestant uh, Catholic priests escape, evade detection um, before finally being caught and um, put to death. Um, a couple of women were put to death by Henry VIII, uh, most famously Margaret Cole. She was the Countess of Stafford. She was a noblewoman. She was the, the, the mother of Reginald Pole, Cardinal Pole, who was the, the reformer who was, uh, came back under Queen Mary when they went back to Catholicism. Um, he killed her to get to him, but the reason being that is they had royal blood. Uh, Reginald Pole could have been King of England. It's kind of weird. Um, but that was basically, there were only three women, three women, three women executed under Elizabeth uh, at that point. So it was only a handful, like five. Um, 19 more died in prisons, mostly in York, presumably following the pilgrimage of race. And so you see the Reformation and the sort of divide it opens up affects everyone. It affects even uh, women who, again, some of them, you know, um, do great things in this period, but also you can see, again, just how, um, just how well, just how divisive it really was in a lot of ways. 
So that is our lecture for uh, for um, on the Reformation and the Reformation. Well, and this anyway, we'll talk about next time the uh, the wars of religion, which is directly related to your essay. So hope this guy wasn't too long for you guys. Uh, feel free, by the way, give me any feedback on this. If you have any questions or advice for improvement, uh, I will take it. I promise. Uh, don't feel afraid. But anyway, uh, thank you guys. Take care, and uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you guys soon.